lovely. Okay, I'm ready to talk about the state of the EOS constitution and by extension, the state of governance for the EOS public blockchain. Uh, and if you, as you start to have questions, just type them into chat as I'm talking. I either will pick them up or I'll catch them at the end. Either. So let's talk about uh, the Constitution in the context of what governance is. Uh, I claim that governance is a system of making collective decisions, which for a decentralized network is pretty important if you want to actually go anywhere or steer or evolve or adapt. Uh, then having made the decision, you have to carry out the decision. And if you've ever been watching, say, some of the Bitcoin SegWit block size stuff, it's like, I thought we decided this. And maybe they did or didn't decide, but they didn't carry out the thing that they some people thought they decided. Uh, and then the third is to tweak the decision-making rules themselves. I think our sizing just changed. Can we make the slides bigger again, please? Uh, and so you need to do all three of those things. Uh, now, the Constitution was written in the context of a, a whole bunch of research that we did, lawyers we talked to. Um, one thing in particular I want to call out because it was so incredibly helpful in framing our thinking around the creation of uh, the Constitution, the entire governance structure, it was this book called Governing the Commons by Eleanor Ostrom. And Eleanor Ostrom was a co-winner of the 2009 Nobel Prize in economics for her lifetime work on this question of how do real people actually manage common resources, not how do they in theory do it or not do it, but like literally going out and looking at indigenous people and, and local cultures and, you know, farmers and fishermen and whatnot. And, oh, look, they're managing their fishery just fine, even though theory says they can't. Uh, what's up with that? And so here's what she found when she studied dozens and dozens and even hundreds of these real world examples. Uh, I think at one point Ostrom said that if theory and data come into conflict, you have to adjust the theory. And she had the facts. Uh, so here's what she found, that the successful communities always had some kind of clear group uh, definition, a definition who's in and who's out. There's some kind of a boundary around the, you know, who, who's in and who's out. Uh, of the of the community for managing this common pool resource. Matching the rules to the local conditions and making sure that the people affected by the rules actually can participate in modifying them. Now we often think of number three as being about legitimacy of the rules, but it's more than that. It's about a tight learning loop. Because when you're out there trying to make the rules work and they aren't working for you, telling like Washington DC that dudes, this isn't working for us here, I mean, you really think that they're going to be able to be responsive to you. Uh, it was Thomas Jefferson who said, if we had to uh, plant our crops and, and, and harvest on rules from Washington, we would soon want bread. Uh, and he's absolutely correct. You've got to have local rules controlled by local people. And of course, making sure that the rule making rights of the community get respected by the outsiders, because there's nothing worse than making the rules, they're starting to work for you, and then some genius from DC or, or Fresno or wherever comes in and says, oh, uh, we, we here in the, in the state capital or, or the UN or wherever, we know so much better than you. Look at our impressive degrees and credentials. Uh, we're going to apply our thinking to your reality. Uh, guaranteed disaster there. The fifth of the eight things that Ostrom found is that community members are able to monitor each other's behavior. So if you're out fishing, we can see you fishing. And if we see you out in the field, you know, grazing your sheep when you're not supposed to, we can, we can see that. And then of course, number six, graduated sanctions for rule breakers. And she actually found that the sanctions could be very minor as long as they were reliable. There was a combination of peer pressure and some shame and just a general sense of, yeah, okay, we caught you. Don't do that, dude. And especially the first infraction, just let people know that you're seeing them and that it's not cool. They tend to straighten up and fly right. Um, and of course you need accessible low cost means for dispute resolution in case it's not so clear which rules apply or how to apply them. Uh, and then the ability to have a kind of a fractal system, this ability to build in nested tiers of complexity, starting with the lowest level. Uh, she had a, a terrific story in one of her chapters where she talked in detail about attempting to bring a 
uh, neglected and failed um, agricultural uh, irrigation system back to life. And the crucial first step was to organize the local people at the local level, little groups of five and 10 farms, and to start there, not try and do some top-down thing. So let's have a look at how these eight items uh, fit in with what we're actually doing here. Uh, I'll come back to nested tiers in a second. So uh, who's in and who's out? Well, if you're, you're in, if you're a token holder who has signed the constitution, I would claim if you perform any function on the chain, you have signed the constitution. Uh, the matching of local rules to local conditions. Yeah, the block, we have a blockchain. And inside a blockchain, you can define an enclave. You can have a DAP or a set of DAPs. And you can say, people who are using my DAP are governed by special rules when they're in my DAP, like the chat uh, group or a game that you're playing. During this game, you're allowed to steal from other players, even though in this ecosystem as a whole, theft is illegal. But we're talking about game items in gameplay and where theft is a game move, right? Met local conditions. Uh, we have referenda in theory. We're working on referendum code right now. And of course, discussion groups and events like this for participating. Uh, number four is perhaps the least understood element. The way that the EOS mainnet protects itself, or at least has the ability to protect itself from uh, outside uh, authorities is something called UNCITRAL. That's the United Nations uh, Committee on International Trade Regulation and, and Trade Law. And they have, uh, since the 50s, 1950s, been publishing uh, every couple of years revised guidelines for what constitutes uh, international trade arbitration. And while the UN's been doing that, they've also encouraged nation states to sign something called uh, the Arbitration Act every like 157 countries have signed some version of the Arbitration Act. They all reference back to the 1958 New York Convention on Respect for Foreign Arbitral Awards. And what that does is it says that if you're a party to arbitration and if you go through arbitration, then and if the arbitration follows the uncentral guidelines and is substantially fair, then whatever ruling comes from the arbitration process is enforceable in local courts and local courts will not overrule it. That means that you and your business partner across the globe can go to arbitration, get a finding, enforce it and move on. And if the loser tries to appeal it to a local court, the local court, if it's one of these 157 countries is gonna say, no, it's covered by UNCITRAL, you've received uh, the arbitration you're entitled to, well, we're done. And of course, the appeal is if the arbitrator screws up or doesn't follow the rules or has a conflict and so forth. So tremendously important uh, function that the arbitration portion of our governance does for us in terms of protecting us. Uh, then the, the next five through eight uh, community members can monitor each other's behavior. Oh my gosh, yes, blockchains are public. Uh, very much so. And we've seen a large number of people come up with various kinds of block explorers and reports and whatnot showing how people are voting and how this wallet controls these votes. It's really interesting stuff. Uh, of course, graduated sanctions are available through Ricardian contracts, the Constitution and arbitration, plus, of course, SUDU uh, can help uh, the block producers carry out arbitration awards. Uh, that is not proven code, but it is in testing. And of course, accessible, low cost dispute resolution. We have an open market for arbitration. Uh, lastly, uh, of these eight, the ability to nest enclaves is presumed, but not demonstrated, at least not that I know of. We know that the design supports this. And here's what I'd like you to imagine. Um, imagine you have an entire group of distributed games and they all band together and say, we are the kingdom of games. And we've got a set of rules that everybody has to follow when you play one of our games. And the game writers all indemnify each other against losses uh, and guarantee each other's good behavior, which is why people are willing to play with those games. And then uh, within that group, so you, they've got their own rule set. It's nested inside of the constitution. And so they can have exceptions where, hey, we have our free speech forum here in the game kingdom. 
and in the free speech forum, you can say anything about anybody, and we all agree that that's the truth, that, that you can't, in fact, say anything. In fact, we're suspending the rules against libel and slander in this forum. You can say all kinds of unsubstantiated crap, and it's not actionable because you agreed that it wasn't when you signed up. And as long as you say things about other people who've also signed, <laughs> and you keep that in the forum, uh, there you go. So, and then let's imagine that a bunch of game masters get together and say, we need our own little group inside the kingdom of games. And they decide that it should be one person, one vote and not token voting. And sure, you can set that up as well. And so you've got the game masters inside the kingdom, inside the constitution, nesting levels of smaller and smaller, more detailed, more focused uh, rulemaking for yourself. So there you have it. Uh, I could go on, I've got another, 40 or 50 slides, but we're well past my 10 minutes. I think we've already got questions queued up. So let's take the next two and a half minutes or so uh, and just talk about those, uh, uh, answer those questions. Let's see, can I turn off my screen sharing? No idea. There it is, thanks. So questions from the audience. Uh, we did have one. Oh, I see questions in the question queue. Ha. Huh. Uh, I see, will there ever be more than 21 primary block producers? Uh, sure, if a constitutional amendment is passed, changing the magic number 21 to a different magic number. Absolutely. I see there was a comment under there. Uh, weigh the price. This sentence, no verb. Um, did Ostrom's research apply primarily to small communities, usually accountable through knowing each other? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, uh, that's a tremendously important point that all of Ostrom's successful communities were no larger than 50,000 uh, in population. Now you could say that, well, the majority of token holders are, tokens are held by just a few hundred people. So that's a really small community. Uh, yeah, that's a challenge. And you know, how relevant is Ostrom's research to a global and disconnected community? Uh, made up of blockchains and trustless systems. Uh, it does indeed seem orders of magnitude more complex than a fishing village. And yes, you are correct. This is an unproven approach, uh, which is why we're seeing so many struggles. And of course, that question was from the awesome Marcin, who is uh, keeping us all on our toes as we face these challenges. It's one of my favorite skeptics, Marcin. Um, familiar with spiral dynamics and it's popularized by Don Beck. I'm a little bit familiar with spiral dynamics as it applies to organizational development in the work of Frederick Lelou uh, and his book, Reinventing Organizations. I do think that teal organizations have a lot of benefit they can get from going onto a blockchain and using the uh, decentralized and autonomous features that are made possible through blockchain technology to help organize them at ever greater levels. I think Bertsorg, for instance, which is a uh, Netherlands-based nursing organization, uh, could expand worldwide, uh, potentially, if they had, say, a blockchain-based uh, backbone to help them do that. Let's see, other questions? The questions reorder with votes. It's very odd. The Constitution will be a minefield. It may take years to perfect. Let's hope you don't have too many sleepless nights. Not a question. And uh, looks like a follow on about complex multicultural communities versus global communities. Uh, look, we're, we are going to have to figure out how to self-organize. We've got a bunch of birds, but we are not a flock because flocks fly in the same direction. And we are flying all over the place and some of us are perching and some of us are crapping on each other. Uh, so yeah, we are a bunch of birds, but we're not yet a flock. And that to me is probably the next stage in organization. We've been up for what, two months? Uh, it's okay, I think, that we're still stumbling around at least a little bit. Uh, I'm looking forward to our next level of self-organization. Uh, we have some milestones to look forward to. We have to have our first referendum. We have to have our first um, major arbitration decision. We have to have our first arbitration um, appeal. Uh, we have to have our first arbitration that's appealed to a local court. We have to have our first referendum whose result is confusing or ambiguous. We have to have our first instance where two referenda both pass and they contradict each other. All of these are coming, I promise you. 
uh, and how we handle them will tell us a lot about who we're going to be as a community. That's just the nature of this stuff. Uh, you know, we have to figure out how we get more, uh, say, Chinese and Korean people uh, active in the governance process, which so far has been dominated almost exclusively by native speakers of English uh, and the small group of folks who are most active on the Gov channel and a few other governance related channels. You know, that's that's our growth right there. That's our growth path. Um, and I'm not saying I have the answers. I'm saying that that is a good overview of the questions. And we've got more questions showing up. I know my time is up. How often do you see the Constitution should be changed um, as infrequently as possible and as often as necessary? Probably giving community based apps in early stages. Um, I would say that you're going to find that a lot of your native intelligence um, is going to serve you well. Starting small and scaling up is important. Using test nets is important. Um, having a time limited game play or DAP play where you say, okay, we're going to run with this set of rules for this period of time and then we're going to stop and see what happened. Uh, and build in some guardrails and prevent, you know, token flight uh, out of your DAP in the short term. Uh, and, and do some really good defensive programming. I tell you, the biggest risk I see for most DAPs is the incredible impatience and excessive optimism of most blockchain developers. If you took all the developers in the world and lined them up in terms of how impatient they are, it's not that all the impatient ones are in blockchain, but all the blockchain people, they're all incredibly impatient. Uh, and so at the end, they rush their code into production. They don't do adequate testing. They often don't test at all. Now, and we, show, we saw that with block one rolling out the supposed fix to the RAM, where there was going to increase RAM by 1K per, per block, and it increased it by 1.5 gigabytes in one jump, followed by 1K per block. That was a bug. Uh, I promise you that was not adequately tested, and I know it wasn't adequately tested because it had that bug, which should have revealed itself in, in proper testing. So that kind of thing is a great risk to your DAP community. Uh, so start small, iterate a lot, get some white hat testing, um, embrace your, your critics and your skeptics and the people who want to prove that your system screwed up. Kevin Rose insists it wasn't a bug, it was a user error. Uh, okay, that's supposed to make me feel better? And I think we tapped out on questions. I don't see any new ones showing up in the. Should IQ of voters be taken into consideration to run a smarter governance? I've met some really intelligent people who could not think they would have a paper bag when it came to practical matters of governance. So no, I don't think IQ is in the least bit useful. And to the extent that IQ protects people from the real world, it's actually reverse correlated with wisdom. Uh, does the Constitution explicitly recognize the enforceability of foreign arbitral awards? Um, no, the Constitution provides you with arbitration. You've got that backwards. It's not that the Constitution does that. It's other countries do that. We are a commercial enterprise. Our Constitution is essentially a large um, user agreement for a private club, if you will. I've got a Kevin McSheehan question, which totally needs an answer. Uh, future of code is intended tying into governance. Don't think I understand that. Could you describe what happened if a DAO-like hack occurred? Um, so there wouldn't be a rollback. Um, one of the things that happened, as I recall it from the DAO, um, is I said seems to be inversely correlated, Enrique, not is. Uh, with the DAO hack, they had some smart things in there, including a time delay on, on uh, removal of money. 
And so we've got the ability with ECAF uh, and the new on-chain communication between ECAF and the block producers to a fairly quick response to an urgent problem. So if you know 30% of all EOS tokens were in some contract that was going down the tubes over a 30-day delay period, there would be plenty of time for that to be a process to be interrupted. All right. Thomas, uh, thanks so much. Uh, great uh, presentation. Great. I uh, tried to keep it within the time. I'm, I'm ashamed <laughs> that I went seven and a half minutes over. A great q and I'm sure people are going to ask you so many questions. And, and, and thanks for being there in all these uh, um, webcasts. And, and that's, I really appreciate your time. I will, I will never turn down uh, an interview, a screencast, a webcast, a podcast, ever. Just if people want it, I will totally show up for that as much as I possibly can. I missed one um, yesterday because I was actually feeling pretty sick, uh, but I'm, I'm better now. Dennis, good to see you, man. There Scotty. you have it. Th Thomas is- Dang, uh, keys. Look at all the, man, it's like all my buds are here. That's awesome. Yeah, right. thanks so much. And channel. All right, I got to go. All right, all right sounds, sounds good, Thomas. Take care.